Now, liberty issue number two. Because liberty is liberty, folks. It comes in different forms. It can be economic. It can be uh, physical, personal, individualistic. It can be um, uh, intellectual. That is what you say, what you think, what you write, so forth and so on. And it can always come under attack. See, I would argue that the modern media, or the pseudo-media today, is actually undermining the freedom of the press by the way they conduct themselves and the way they abuse that phrase. But I want to get into the other liberty issue. It's an economic issue. And this is where some of you are going to turn left and just keep going. It's an economic issue. It's as much in the news, or let me check that, it's as relevant as everything I just discussed about the media. And that's trade. Trade. The earliest, earliest civilizations wanted trade, were involved in trade. They wanted to know what's on the other side of the world. What do they have that we don't have? We want what what they have. What kind of knowledge do they have? What kind of information do they have? Who are they? What are they? You see, to close off trade, uh, just stick with me, is to close off, among other things, your intellectual capacity to learn, to gain information, to gain knowledge. Look at North Korea. You've got people over there who have no idea what's going on in the rest of the world. They don't learn about the Enlightenment. They don't learn about Reformation. They don't learn about republicanism, constitutionalism. They don't learn any of that stuff. They're not aware of it. In addition to the material wealth that, that is denied them. Trade is, 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 is trade in material. It's trade in services, but it's also trade in creativity, ingenuity, knowledge, information. We are the strongest economic force the planet has ever seen because there was a period of time, largely in the 19th century, when we were virtually tariff-free. I'm not talking about the rest of the world. I'm talking about us. The left attacks the Industrial Revolution. And now I find so-called populists attacking it too. Maybe not directly. But nonetheless, that's why they attack John Rockefeller, Mellon, Carnegie, Ford, not talking about their political views, robber barons, they used to call them. They and others brought us mobility, electricity, heat in our homes, air conditioning in our homes. They and others propelled this nation into an economic juggernaut the planet has never seen before. And despite all that you've been told and learned, the vast majority of people in the United States benefited from it and would benefit from it and would benefit from it, as would those parts of the world then engaged in it. Capitalism. We should not be afraid of material that is available overseas. We should not be afraid of products and services that are available overseas. We should not be afraid of knowledge and information that's available overseas. If other countries are afraid, that's their problem. If they want to be poor, that's their problem. If they want to be dumber, That's their problem. I'm not talking about when they steal our technology. That's a whole other issue. I'm talking about trade. What is trade? Of course, we have copyright laws. We have trademark laws. We have patent laws. We have uh, proprietary information laws. We We have export regimes. That's all good. That's all good. That creates a, it, it, it's, it's, it's like a, a courtroom. You need, you need rules. Right? Certain rules of trade, certain rules in the courtroom, certain rules of behavior in your family. Nothing wrong with that. 
Nothing wrong with that. But when the government intervenes, when the government intervenes for the purpose of claiming we need a level playing field or things need to be fair, that's irrational. And this is where some of you are going to take a left turn and leave me. I can't help it. I hope you'll be inquisitive enough to stay with me. It's irrational. A tariff is a tax. You're going to tax the American people to punish another country? You're going to raise the price of toasters and washing machines and dishwashers and automobiles on average Americans, middle class Americans, by potentially in the aggregate thousands and thousands of dollars to punish other governments and other countries? Do you see how absolutely irrational that is? I know all the phony jingoistic arguments. We need to protect our our industrial heartland. But we don't protect our industrial heartland by massively increasing the cost of products on the American people who will buy less of them. I will tell you, take a look at steel. We have a huge tariff placed on steel now. If any country wants to sell steel into this country, well, let's just pick one, Canada. Canada, which is which sells most of the steel that we get overseas to us, not China, Canada. A 25% tax. That tax isn't on Canada. That tax isn't on Canadian steel companies. That tax isn't on the Canadian taxpayer. That tax is on you. Now, our domestic companies, they're very competitive. They don't sit still and say, all right, good. Good. Now we can control foreign imports of steel by driving up the price to the American consumer and American businesses, GM, Chrysler, Ford, the assembly line men and women who work there. Last time I checked, they're not billionaires and millionaires. They're hardworking American citizens. They're blue-collar citizens who work with their hands. Well, they're going to be affected negatively. Now, these American steel companies that you think are so patriotic, they raise their prices, too. Do you know why? Because the president has limited competition. That's why. They raise their prices, too. You raise 25% of tax on steel coming into this country on the American people. These steel companies don't sit here and say, you know what, we're going we're gonna to drop our prices. You know what they do? They increase their prices. Because now's the time to really make it. And we subsidize that, subsidize that kind of behavior. And so in order to protect maybe 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 jobs, we lose 200,000 jobs. Downstream. Is that liberty? Is that what makes a country wealthy? All right, I have to take a break. We'll be right back. Mark Lovin. By the way, very quickly, as a footnote to the point about the indictment of 12 of uh, Putin's apparatchiks over there in Russia who never have any intention of setting foot in the United States and will never see the inside of a courtroom, in the United States, much drama and bravado. I agree that if somebody is trying to interfere in an election, in a democratic society, they should be punished. And I agree, particularly if we can get our hands on them, they should be indicted. And so my question to Mr. Mueller is, is there a reason why you haven't indicted Barack Obama for interfering with the election in Israel? The evidence is all over the country. It's all over the place. I'll pull it together and email it to you. You don't even have to hire another Democrat prosecutor. Is there a reason why Mr. Rosenstein in his press conference today didn't say that we will also be looking at Barack Obama? Not because he interfered, uh, not because uh, of the Russian interference in our election, but because of his interference in the Israeli election. 
I mean, ladies and gentlemen, we ought to have standards here. I don't believe the Russians should have interfered in our election. I don't believe Obama should have interfered in our election, which he did through his surrogates at the FBI and so forth. But he also interfered in the election in Israel because he sought to defeat the prime minister who was running for re-election, Benjamin Netanyahu. Is there a reason why that moral standard doesn't apply to Barack Obama? Is there a reason why he hasn't been indicted? And we can get our hands on him, by the way. You know, 